Hello and welcome to this very special Good Day Street Talk as we celebrate black history. I'm Antoine Lewis and for the next half hour, we take a look at some of the most fascinating people who have not only been inspired by the African American experience, but are now passing along their journey to a whole new generation. We begin at the iconic Apollo Theater, where a then nine-year-old girl from Washington Heights had dreams of stage and stardom, and she got her very first professional break here. And since that time, New York's own Leslie Uggams has never looked back. From a role in one of the most historic events in television history, to her new role in the Marvel Universe on the big screen, Actress and singer Leslie Uggams continues reaching new heights in her legendary career, a career that started at the Apollo Theater. So when you think about the theater here, what, do you, what comes to mind, Miss Uggams? Little Leslie Uggams standing there on that stage with an act that was 20 minutes long where I tap danced and she has this big bow and this little pleated dress and I was as cute as a button. <laughs> <laughs> I've done so many things in so many different avenues. And uh, I think it really is because I got my start at this theater. Because it was like going to a school. Because you were watching these incredible artists. And you learned from them. And you watched how they engaged an audience. And, uh, and it was a tough audience. Still is tough, but it was really tough when I was starting. I mean, if you weren't good, vegetables could come landing <laughs> on the stage. It was that experience that brought her to the Broadway stage and winning a Tony for her first role in the musical Hallelujah Baby. But it was on television where Leslie Uggams would make history as the first female African-American host of a variety show, while also making her mark behind the scenes by hiring black personnel. Because we had the talent to do it and we just weren't given the opportunities and I felt that I wanted to speak up um, and say, hey, you need some flavor here. But if we don't say, hey, we need people to have jobs, who is? <laughs> She would make her mark yet again, this time in the role of Kizzy, and as part of the ensemble behind what became a true television phenomenon, Alex Haley's Roots. None of us expected what happened. I was in Vegas rehearsing Guys and Dolls, and after the first show, people were, you know, walking through the casino, and they were kind of looking at a thing, because I hadn't come on yet. And then after the second show, people were like, oh. And then I couldn't get room service because everybody was staying in to watch Roots, even in the casinos. And Ann Margaret called me up and she said, Leslie, we've changed the time of the show because nobody wants to miss Roots and I don't want to miss Roots. And so shows went on later. And then after Roots was over, then they would do, do the shows. Now, nearly four decades later, Leslie Uggams is being introduced to a whole new generation on the big screen, playing Blind Al in Marvel's recently released Deadpool. It's totally unexpected how people know me. <laughs> I am totally out of the box. <laughs> and that's what I loved about it. And at the same time, another strong black character because, uh, you know, she doesn't take any sass from Mr. Deadpool. And you guessed right, she's making her long-awaited return to television in the hit show Empire this spring. Every now and then I'd sit there and go, I should be on that show, <laughs> you know, because I love it so much. To get an opportunity to join this phenomenal show, so beautifully written, and this incredible hip-hop music as well, I'm thrilled, I can't wait. But beyond all of her success, Leslie Uggams remembers those who have shown her the way and enjoys the opportunity of passing that torch. I'm always being taught by Cicely. Every time she does something, I go, wow, can I do that, <laughs> you know? And uh, so if you're willing to take it in, take it in. I used to say, it's still all the good stuff. <laughs> Such a pleasure. Nope, you get it. Oh, thank you. Well, I love you. So Channel 5 is lucky to have you. Oh my you. gosh, no. Thank you so much, Miss Yu. Still to come, our emotional sit-down with basketball great Walt Clyde Frazier when we return.
Basketball Hall of Famer Walt Clyde Frazier helped bring the New York Knicks their only two championships, a powerful force on the court who defied the odds off of it. I wear these every day, man, with a lot of pride. This is symbolic of a perfect season. Everything has to go right. I don't live upon this, I, you know, but I wear them. When I don't have them on, I feel naked. You know, it's just a way of, uh, I think, embellishing who I am and what I've accomplished in life. A life that began in Atlanta, Georgia, where he learned to play basketball on a dirt field, the only playground available to blacks in the segregated South. In retrospect, I think that's one of the best things that ever happened to me growing up under the oppression of segregation. Because that's who I am today, that's why I'm dressed this way. Because when I went downtown, I had to wear my best clothes, put on my best manners. And my parents said, you're not only representing the Frasers, but you're representing your race. I remember when I played basketball, if I scored 30 points, the coach would bring me an article of a white guy that scored 40. <laughs> so by doing that, I could never rest on my laurels. You know, so no matter how good you are, they always told me, man, you gotta be twice as good as this guy, because he's gonna get the job. Sheer determination led him to New York, where he was drafted in the first round by the Knicks in 1967. But he never lost sight of where he came from. When I came here, I was 22, man, in the greatest city in the world, living my dream. So I was just having fun. But I always took time to talk to people, try to give back and help those that wanted to help themselves. That's my image. Which brings us to present day and the new chapter in Walt Frazier's life. Broadcaster, basketball legend, New York City icon, and yes, restaurateur, where he always takes time to talk to fans at Clyde Frazier's Wine and Dine. I like the motif. Yeah, these are replicas of the suits, of my suits. Oh, wow. <laughs> This is also where he's finding out that he's inspiring a whole new generation of fans. Kids that are five and ten years old that are telling me, Clyde, you're the greatest, you're the best Nick ever, you know, and how inspiration I've been to had to their lives. So it's the whole spectrum that I cover, red, yellow, black, and white, man. And it just keeps me very humble. That's why you always see me with a smile on my face. But this new chapter is also giving him an opportunity to do something deeply personal, reflect on his past. My mother had me when she was 16, so we had a very close relationship. And uh, she provided the impetus for everything that I did in sports. Because I wanted to buy her house. She was always talking about a house with a big kitchen. <laughs> so I remember I used to pray at night, God, please let me be a basketball player, football player, so that I can buy my mom this house. So in 1973, I was able to do that. So for me at that time, that was why I played the game. I've tried to live a respectful life, try to do it with pride, class, dignity, giving back, showing respect to other people. And uh, if I had to do all over again, I don't think I would really change anything at this point in my life. Last question for you, sir. Toughest opponent Clyde Frazier ever faced on the court? Nobody gave the Clyde trouble. <laughs> Jazz legend, cultural icon, international celebrity. We may have lost the beloved Louis Armstrong 45 years ago, but his memory is very much alive here in Queens as his home turned museum is opening its doors to a whole new generation. It's in the middle of Corona, Queens, part of suburbia, you yeah. know, here. But tell us about the importance of making sure that it stays here. So much of Lewis's story is really a hero's journey. He started off extremely poor as a child, uh, dirt poor. And when I say poor, I'm talking pre-safety net poverty. But he became one of the greatest trumpet players in New Orleans. Once he moved to Chicago, he pretty much took over the world. But when you hear all these accomplishments, you got to realize he's living in a regular home in Queens. This was a place for him to collect his thoughts. It was a place for him to archive his life. This kitchen was built in 1970. It's very influenced by the World's Fair, which is just a couple blocks from here. I always say this was like a George Jetson kitchen. In that time period, they thought this is what the future would look like. You know, him and Lucille, they didn't have any children. But when he would come home on the band bus, he would hit the horn, and the neighborhood children would surround the bus. 
They were bringing the equipment. They were bringing the luggage. He would line them up in front of the television downstairs and feed them ice cream. His nickname for the neighborhood children were My Little Ice Cream Eaters. You'll notice like Martin Luther King's funeral. He sat there and watched it on television and recorded it with his own microphone, with his own commentary. So these were issues for him. But he saw himself culturally as a musician. He saw himself as a working man. He saw himself as a person who could make great change through what he did best. Which was his music. Which was his music, yes. Up next, singer and songwriter Valerie Simpson on legacy and life after the passing of Nick Ashford. They were the dynamic songwriting team behind some of Motown's biggest hits, as well as a successful performing pop duo in their own right. We can only be talking about the incomparable Ashford and Simpson. But even after her husband Nick's untimely passing five years ago, Valerie Simpson is still keeping their music and their legacy alive. Walking through sugar bar is like taking a step into African history, a virtual museum with its walls dressed in cultural artifacts. But to Valerie Simpson, her New York City eatery also reflects a step forward for a new generation of talent. That's what this place represents. That's what the sugar bar represents. A platform, a stage where you can get it on. And I've seen some of these kids go on and do great things. You know, from this stage to a Broadway stage, it's phenomenal, but it can happen. It's magical. And that magic happened for a then 17-year-old Valerie Simpson from the Bronx when she met another aspiring artist from Michigan named Nicholas Ashford. He came to New York and he wanted to make it as a dancer and somebody told him he wasn't doing too well with the dance and they said, well, you can get a free meal up at White Rock and that was my church. And so he came up there not to see me but for the food and uh, we met and hit it off because he wrote gospel songs. Yeah. Soon they began to sing together in the church choir, but little did they know it would be their talent behind the music that would change their lives forever. I played the piano, played in church, but I hadn't written songs, but that was his forte. So because I could play so well, he and I just started, you know, fooling around the piano, and we just had a great chemistry, and so uh, that let me know. I didn't know there was a career to be had as a songwriter. You know, I didn't know that, you know, somebody would record your song and you would make money. I, it, that wasn't even, I was having so much fun. After giving Ray Charles a hit in 1966, Ashford and Simpson got a call from the hottest record company in the business, Motown. They listened to our demos, they loved what they heard, and they sent us a ticket and we were like, this is it. Motown, are you kidding? That was a writer's dream. Motown assigned them to Marvin Gaye and Tammy Terrell. You know, the first song that we actually gave them was Ain't No Mountain High Enough. Ain't no mountain high, ain't no and when we had that song, it's like, you know, you got a golden apple in your pocket. You know, this can't fail. Just call my name. And uh, sure enough, you know, it was just what they needed to launch their duet career. And hit after hit kept coming, but soon Nick and Valerie would face their biggest challenge yet, producing the debut solo album for the queen of Motown, Diana Ross. She was the darling of the company, and so the challenge of coming up with something special, you know, just was like, it was on us. We picked Ain't No Mountain High Enough to redo, and Nick liked uh, Diana's speaking voice. He said it was so sexy. I didn't get it, but he liked it, you know? <laughs> he was right. <laughs> <laughs> if you need me, call me. But it worked really well, you know, it took it to number one, so. But with so much success behind the stage, Val and Nick began to think about stepping onto the stage. Our contracts were up as writers, and we were deliberating over, you know, whether we should stay uh, or whether we should, you know, launch a solo career. So we thought, well, maybe it's time to, you know, take a leap of faith and just, you know, step out on our own. And the rest is music history. After a trip to the altar in the 70s, Ashford and Simpson had a string of hit songs both on their own and for other artists. But their biggest hit came in 1984. Now it's time. The married pop duo would continue to make music and magic together until 2011, when Nick Ashford passed away. 
when you lose someone and you're part of, of a duo the way we were uh, and have to experience that thing, it's almost like a, a predecessor to, you know, uh, your own uh, transition. It's also about my life and it makes the music more important. It lets me know that it, that it touched people and it really is a solace to you when, you when you hear the real effect and how people are genuinely moved by all it is that you've done or t attempted to do. I truly miss him. I mean, because, there, you know, there, there was like nobody like this guy. So sitting down to piano to write a song without the aid or help of that, you know, person that I'm used to all the time. And I didn't want to immediately jump into a, another partnership. I said, let me just see, you know, what's inside Valerie. So that's a new journey. You just, it's, it's another chapter. So we just have to see how it unfolds, you know, but it's going to be fun. From business to the arts, the Greater Harlem Chamber of Commerce has been the driving force behind the renaissance of Upper Manhattan, as it now celebrates its 120th anniversary. At its helm is its president, Lloyd Williams. I think what impresses me most about the chamber is its motto. The business of business is people. I stand on some lofty shoulders. I succeeded the Honorable Percy E. Sutton. He said to me one day, Lloyd, uh, the key word is common. And he said, and if we remember what we have in common, we will become communal. And if we become communal, we will communicate. And if we communicate, we will have a community. So Harlem has a symbolic importance, a strategic importance, 